great. So let's go ahead and get started here um, to introduce myself and each of us is going to introduce ourselves separately. Um, I'm originally from the suburbs of Chicago. Um, as a person going to college there, I watched the natural areas of my suburb become overrun with development and didn't like it very much. Um, got into birds in the mid 90s and decided to make it my life's career um, once I heard some of the needs in conservation um, at that time when I was learning. So eventually ended up in Jonesboro, Arkansas and graduated from there in 02 and then spent a lot of time going around to different bird jobs throughout the country um, into Canada as well. And so learned a lot about birds and different habitats and their ecology. And pretty much all of those projects that I was able to work on through over maybe a 10 year period were all very conservation focused. Um, but I feel really fortunate that I was able to see a lot of different habitats. Um, and then eventually settled in Missouri in 2008. Um, I am a Missouri Master Naturalist, although I have to say that um, I'm an honorary Master Naturalist with the High Lonesome Chapter out of Cold Camp. So by the end of you all's training, you're going to know more than I do about a lot of different topics because you all get such an excellently well-rounded training. Um, and so I keep trying to learn, but the Master Naturalist program is just awesome. And I'm very excited for you all that, that you're going to be Master, master Naturalist very soon. So Paige and Ethan and I are with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Um, Ethan and I founded this in 2010 based on some work that we were doing with both research and education here in the Missouri River Valley over here in Saline County. So we're an hour and a half or so away from you right now. And our mission is just kind of a tagline here, conservation via science, education, and advocacy. And so basically everything that we do as an organization is conservation focused. And because this is a little bit relevant to the discussion of ornithology this evening, I just wanted to go into a little bit about what is the bird observatory exactly, because it's a little bit of an old fashioned term. Um, there are quite a lot of bird observatories in North America, but a lot of them in the last maybe 20, 25 years have actually changed their names um, to reflect more of a conservation or science focus. Um, so for example, Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory out in Colorado is now Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. So just as an example. So traditionally, a bird observatory is an organization that bans or, and or counts birds, basically doing a lot of census work and just sort of keeping track of bird populations over time um, would be one of the main focuses of traditional bird observatories. But today, most are actively working on conservation issues. So this is ornithology of the past. Um, this was a very, very common practice amongst pretty much all ornithologists um, up until uh, the 1950s, 60s, 70s even, I'm happy to say that collecting birds in order to identify, measure, or do other research on them does not happen nearly as much today as it did previously. Um, a lot of really important knowledge was gained from this method of study, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about bird decline throughout this presentation and, you know, going out and shooting birds is probably not the best way to go about study these days. So, um, previously though, there was sort of a golden age of observational ornithology as well. So I'm pulling up a couple of papers from the American Ornithologist Union Journal, which is called, or was previously called the AUK. You can see up here, it's from 1930. And a lot of these are really, really nice descriptive and observational studies that did occur. Um, as well as the collection. So you can see here, you know, this is talking about long-eared owls and, and collecting pellets of long-eared owls and studying over 1,500 of them to learn what certain owls in East Central Illinois were, were eating for their diet. Um, and here's one where the author explains that he read John Muir and so all he really wanted to do was go study the water oozel, which is uh, the, the colloquial term for the American Dipper out west. So good stuff and, you know, little 
not as great stuff. Now, ornithologically speaking, many, many things are about conservation, not as much about basic research and basic biology. So um, these are the kinds of things that ornithologists are dealing with now. And we are all together as a united front in conserving our bird species across North America and the world. There are also good things about being an ornithologist now, um, and those are largely in the technological advances. So MODIS is, as you can see here, a wildlife tracking system. You can see the little antenna, right, coming off this plover right here. And this is a system that Ethan's gonna talk a little bit more about, but as someone that's been studying birds for over 20 years, this is something that honestly I've been waiting for for over those 20 years. So there, there are some, some neat methods of study that are only possible because we are here in the 2020s. So tonight we're going to study ornithology, which is the study of birds, of course. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about identification and taxonomy and, and sort of so how birds are grouped into families and what, um, I'm not gonna go extremely deeply into evolution, um, but the course of evolution resulted in the taxonomy that we study today. And it is very helpful with identification. Ethan's gonna talk about avian communications. Paige is gonna talk about anatomy and physiology. We're gonna give a brief overview of some methodology, how you can study birds in the field, and then talk a little bit about conservation. So when it comes to the study of identification and taxonomy, some good places to start. So hopefully folks, I, I heard earlier um, that someone asked all of you if, uh, if you're bird watchers and a lot of people raise your hands. So I think probably a lot of folks are gonna be familiar with field guides. And if you're not for birds, you might be for other critters. Um, but here are a couple that I really like to use for birds. This is National Geographic. Here's Sibley. Um, there's other good ones as well, such as Peterson um, and Kaufman. But one of the things that the best field guides all have in common um, is that they are in taxonomic order. And um, as opposed to say being organized by color, which a lot of beginning birders may use, um, but for the long haul, it will help you um, to, to study a book that is in taxonomic order. And we'll kind of, by the end of my, my discussion of ID, you'll, you'll understand why that is. Um, I would also recommend that your field guide have, this is a bit of a matter of personal preference, but have artists rendering, so drawings instead of photographs. Um, and that's because these are good sort of, this is what the species generally looks like. A photograph um, can be useful, but it's, by its very nature, it is one bird in one place at one time of year, and therefore in one type of plumage, in one type of light. Um, and so there are better photographic guides coming out these days than there were previously. Um, I still prefer the drawings. And then having range maps there on the pages is also a really important consideration. So a couple things that um, I do believe that either Ethan or Paige are going to talk about a little bit more, but these are great resources. So I wanted to start with them is allaboutbirds.org, which is a Cornell Lab of Ornithology endeavor. Um, all of us use this all the time. So when we're, you know, comparing a photograph for ID, you know, that one of us has taken or that someone has sent to us for ID purposes, um, we'll look at it for that. We'll look at it to get some basic life history information. The, there are also um, brief descriptions of their conservation, of birds conservation statuses. Um, if you wanna get into really deep dives, birds of the world. This was previously birds of North America. It was the very first um, endeavor to document all of the life history information of all of the birds of North America. And now Cornell has, and partners have expanded that to birds of the world. And so when I say life history information, this is what I mean, the stuff on the right-hand side of the screen. So everything from appearance to diet, to breeding and, and nesting and, and how eggs appear, to conservation and management all the way around. And then finally eBird, which 
um, folks might have heard of, and we'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about community science towards the end. So these are all, this is by no means an exhaustive list of things I think are great resources, but they're great, great places to start. And they're things that we all, um, we all consult all the time. So taxonomy and identification. So taxonomy isn't scary at all. All it is basically is grouping birds into families based on their evolutionary history that you don't even necessarily have to know about that history, although it's super fun to study. Um, but it is not intimidating because you already do it. And I, I can, I'm about to prove that. So I don't know if, I, I don't know if I'll hear you if you shout out, but please do feel free to shout out. Um, so what kind of bird is this? And I'm not even saying exact species. Woodpecker. Woodpecker. Okay. I heard, I heard, I heard some folks. I heard woodpecker. <laughs> yep. I heard woodpecker. Okay. So check out this bird, right? And then is this a woodpecker? No. No, not a woodpecker. They look really, really similar, right? They're both black and white. And the first one was definitely a woodpecker. So why isn't this one a woodpecker? And I'm sure you all know, you already are putting these birds into sort of categories mentally. This isn't a woodpecker partially because of just the, the posture of this bird, right? The beak isn't exactly right. Just nothing about this says woodpecker. Um, it happens to be a black and white warbler, just so folks know. Um, but you already used taxonomy um, to put those birds into their respective families. What about this? And again, I don't need to know the exact species, but group. Ducks, right? We're looking at ducks here. Um, <laughs> Wendy's pointing at someone. And what about these? These birds are in water. Are they ducks? Of course they're not ducks. Right, so you wouldn't think every single bird that's in the water is a duck just because it's in the water or shares some characteristic um, with the duck family. So those are just examples of thinking taxonomically. So when you do what you just did saying, oh, woodpecker, oh, duck, oh, heron, or, or egret, um, either one, or wading bird, or however you, you think of these birds, that will help you know exactly where to look in your taxonomically organized field guide. Right, because otherwise, what you do, for example, with that first woodpecker, is if you were just looking at the fact that that woodpecker was black and white, and that was the only thing that you were going on, you would be flipping through a field guide looking for all the black and white birds. But that's not, you already don't think that way. You would already be like, okay, I'm gonna go look for woodpeckers and then look for black and white woodpeckers. So, this is just a very, very basic overview of taxonomy um, and how ornithologists study um, bird families and their evolution. And so this has been really super interesting over the last you know, 20, 30, 40 years because ornithologists had, had taxonomically organized all of the known bird species of the world. And then genetic testing came out. And so now there's actual DNA evidence showing which birds are more closely related. And a lot of this has come out fairly recently. In fact, much to my dismay, a lot of this has come out since I learned my taxonomy in college and now it's different. And so I spent some time getting ready for this presentation, um, lamenting that hummingbirds were now over here between these families instead of where I used to think of them. Um, and so I honestly, with the newer field guides, I have to like retrain myself as to where birds are. Um, but evolutionarily speaking, we think about birds that are ancestral. Um, a lot of people use the word primitive to, to, to describe birds that evolved longer ago versus evolved much more recently. Um, and so the most primitive bird groups are like ostriches, emus, rays here in North America, birds that we have here, ducks, geese, and swans are gonna be the ones that evolved longest ago. Um, and then galliforms, like what quail and what we think of as game birds. Um, then night jars, this is a night hawk right here. Then hummingbirds. Um, and then, and, I'm, and folks, I'm skipping 
tons of families, as you can imagine. Um, but going along this sort of evolutionary history, um, then warblers, and then um, the very most recently evolved group is actually the cardinalids. Um, so cardinals, buntings, this is an indigo bunting, and this is a uh, young male scarlet or summer tanager. So tanagers, cardinals, and buntings. Okay, so I have found for myself and for many, many other folks that I've talked to and that we as a bird observatory have worked with over the years. Um, this is a, a simple and straightforward way to really know your bird ID. So when you look at a bird, as discussed before, you're not gonna look straight at the colors, right? Because if you only looked at colors, that black and white warbler and that hairy woodpecker um, would have been, they would have looked the same to you and they didn't. Um, so we suggest looking at beak size and shape, and then overall body size and shape, <clears throat> excuse me, bird's posture, distinctive markings, pardon me, and when I say distinctive markings, that's a bit relative, it can be pretty subtle. And then what are your options? Um, so in terms of what can be wherever you are. So if you're in, you know, Casey Mo what birds are likely there, what birds are possible there. In birding, of course, uh, there are always, you know, vagrants, birds that are, are big surprises that don't belong here, that they're, it's not within their range and they do show up. Um, but that is a very rare occurrence. And so typically um, the most simple example, or excuse me, the most, the most simple answer to your, is this bird here or not, is usually the right one. So we'll talk a little bit about range maps in that way. So why beak observations are helpful, and here's some streaky brown birds. Streaky brown birds are often the bane of bird watchers' ID existence. Um, so streaking brown may not always be so helpful, but if you look at their beaks first, these beaks are super different, right? You would never think that this bird is this bird and vice versa if you looked first at the beak. Um, then you can start looking at things like posture, and in this case, behavior. So here we have a savanna sparrow and a brown creeper, very different families of birds, um, very different behaviors, but beaks are very obviously different. So silhouettes, overall size and shape. Um, so you can see this wren here has a cocktail. Um, folks might be familiar with wrens. They're smaller and they hop around a lot versus this common nighthawk that's sitting in a very, very archetypical night jar position on a fence post. But these two things, you know, their postures are giving you clues as well as their appearance as to, as to who they are. So distinctive markings. Um, so this is from a pretty old field guide. It's actually a, a photograph taken from an old field guide. And these are just some things to, to know about and think about and sort of let them bubble away in your subconscious there in the back. Um, so, you know, streaking on birds and striping and eye lines, superciliary stripes, aka eyebrow, um, eye rings and spectacles, crests. Um, so these are all things that, you know, not only as a bird watcher, are you going to really start looking for, I mean, and if you, if you do it for just a little while, it'll become pretty much second nature. But a lot of times your field guides or allaboutbirds.org um, or other various sources or people that you're with even, will we'll refer to these things. Um, so people will say, you know, I didn't, I didn't see an eye line on that bird, so it can't be X. <laughs> I have to thank Ethan for stopping our dog from playing with her chew toy right at this exact minute. So here's an example of distinctive markings that are pretty subtle. And this is often the case with sparrows, but it's still, I think, a very joyful exercise. Um, so we have a chipping sparrow here on the left and an American tree sparrow here on the right. And I like to use this example because these are species that I have definitely messed up. And part of the reason for that is that my eye is drawn to this, this rufous cap right here that they both have. Um, if, you know, if you really start looking closely at these birds though, other than that cap, there's kind of a lot of differences between them actually. So check out the beak color. We have our, a black beaked chipping sparrow 
And this American tree sparrow has a bicolored bill. It's yellow on the bottom and, and black on the top there. You can see that in this picture as well. The color and the extent of the eye line, right? So we, this eye line over here on the tree sparrow is rufous, matches the cap. This eye line over here on the chipping sparrow is black, very different looking eye line. Spot on the chest. And that's a really good ID mark um, on an American tree sparrow. And then gray on the wings. There's a lot of gray here on the shoulder um, of the American tree sparrow and not on the chipping sparrow if you're getting a back view of the bird or a backside view. Um, so these are subtle things. Some folks find sparrows and shorebirds um, frustrating at the beginning. Um, but the more and more that you're around them, the more that you'll see these differences and eventually they won't look the same to you at all, honestly, with binoculars. <laughs> Caveat is with binoculars. Um, so obviously you, you do want to get some decent optics to be able to see these things because rarely will they give you this good of a, of a look without optics. So range maps, and this is what got me about these exact species actually. Um, so chipping sparrow, you can see this peachy color is breeding um, and this, this uh, blue color is non-breeding, so winter. So basically they're here in totally different seasons and that is really, really helpful. So the last time that I mistook one for the other, I was absolutely certain that it was a chipping sparrow, but it was the dead of winter. It was early January. And so I really needed to look at the range maps and think, huh, chipping sparrow is really not gonna be here right now. That really must be an American tree sparrow. Okay, so sometimes it's more difficult than others, but <laughs> you all can already see, you know, these, these, these folks all look quite different. Um, so we're going to go through just a few families right now and really just a few because there's more than 400 species documented in the state of Missouri. Um, many families of birds. We certainly don't have time to go through all of them and you, you know, no one's asking you to just memorize everything to do, 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 do. Um, but we are going to do them in taxonomic order and hopefully you get sort of an idea of that whole um, ancestral, more primitive species versus the, the more derived species, the ones that evolved later, and therefore sort of, you know, thinking about them hierarchically and where to look for them um, in a field guide or in All About Birds or um, whatever source you use. So herons and egrets. Um, actually, so I think if anyone saw the text, Chris, who's on with us virtually, mentioned that herons sound like young pterodactyls and Chris as it turns out they are one of our more primitive quote-unquote species that evolved longer ago so that kind of makes sense they're not quite as long ago as pterodactyls but and I agree with you absolutely that 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 is what they sound like to me also um hawks this is a really familiar family right again so just like with you know the the very beginning woodpecker I think really that, you know, if you see a hawk or an eagle, um, you're going to say that's in the hawk or eagle, eagle family, right? And then once you have narrowed that down, um, there's only so many species that are here in Missouri. I will caution that um, I find red-tailed hawks particularly, which is one of our most common species. Those are the um, quite large hawks that you will see along roadsides. There is an enormous amount of very interesting individual variation within that species. Um, I think that there's as much individual variation in them as there are in humans. It's there; they can be very, very different. So just keep that in mind. The species that you see pictured here do not typically have as much individual variation. So woodpeckers. A lot of folks, you know, like woodpeckers, and this is one of the sort of favorite families out there. Um, really briefly, this is an ID conundrum that a lot of people go through. And one of the most helpful things anyone ever told me was that to, to look at this beak to head ratio. So a hairy woodpecker has a beak that's almost as long as their head. 
and downy has a beak that's about half the size of their head or length, however you want to look at it. So that has made it much easier for me. Um, I do want to note that a cool thing about woodpeckers is that they are primary cavity excavators. A lot of animals, as you all probably know, birds, mammals, insects, amphibians, etc., cetera, um, do live in tree cavities, um, either woodpecker made or not woodpecker made, um, sometimes made by limbs coming off in you know, a knot or whatever, and there's, there's a hole made from that. Um, but woodpeckers are special in that basically they provide homes for other things that do not, that cannot excavate their own cavities. I would also like to note that cavity nesting, birds specifically, but cavity nesting organisms in general have a much higher nest success rate. So for example, um, a cup nesting bird, like a robin would be a, a, a common example of a bird that makes a cup shaped nest, right? We all know what that looks like. Their nest success is anywhere from 15 to 40% would be pretty darn high for a cup nesting bird. Um, woodpeckers and other cavity nesters have nesting success 70 to 90%. So it's a much more protected situation. But why doesn't everyone nest in cavities? Because there's only so many to go around. Uh, chickadees and titmice, these are great backyard birds to start with. They don't look super similar, but they are closely related birds. And the way that I would be able to tell that is their beaks are really, really similar and their vocalizations are really, really similar. Um, Briefly with wrens, they have a slim pointy insect eating beak. Um, we have four different species of wrens here that are here in, in different seasons. And then, oops, there we go. Um, so sometimes it's really helpful to think about birds in terms of what you already know, right? So this bird kind of looks like and has the posture of and the body shape of a robin. Um, we have quite a lot of thrush species here in Missouri, including our state bird, the Eastern bird, bluebird, wood thrush. And you can see that they have similar bills, they have similar bodies, similar shapes, similar postures. Um, so that can help you uh, sort of identify birds into that family. We have a lot of species that have these cone-shaped seed eating beaks, um, four families particularly. Um, so finches are one, sparrows, or another. Um, all of these are members of the blackbird family, which is sometimes surprising to folks. So even Baltimore Oriole is a blackbird, Icteridae is their family, um, Eastern Meadowlark. So not all blackbirds are entirely black. Actually, no, no blackbird is entirely black. Um, but again, they share that sort of uh, insect and seed eating bill. Um, Warblers, I'm, I'm trying to hurry up because I know that East needs to go as well quite soon. Um, we have another situation with slim pointed insect eating beaks. Um, warblers are a tough family to get to know. They are incredibly beautiful and aren't necessarily hard to ID, but they're often very difficult to see because most, almost, almost all of them come to us during the spring and summer season, they are small, leaves are on the trees, they are high in the trees, they are hard to get to know. Um, they're wonderful to get to know, especially by song. Do not frustrate yourself if by trying to focus on that family. There's, um, they, can, they can wait until you feel more confident with your ID. Here's our third family with cone-shaped beaks, the cardinals and buntings. So, Winter, you're coming up on really what is the best time to get to know your birds. Um, this is a picture from Ohio, but this is a great example of, especially if you either, you know, you have a bird feeder or you have some seed on the ground or you have a natural area near you with, you know, abundant food, seeds of any kind, um, birds will sort of congregate and feed and you'll be able to look at them with your binoculars and pick out different birds um, as opposed to trying to, you know, find them 50 feet up in a leafy tree. So you're coming off of this class into a time where bird ID is, is most easily learned. Okay, so 
I think my timing was was okay. Um, and I'm very, very happy to take questions if anyone has any. Ah, what does Rufus mean? Thank you. So it is just a, it's the name of a color, meaning a reddish brown. That's all. Thank you for that. I am going to turn things over to Ethan now, who is going to speak about avian communication. Bird songs are the most eloquent of nature's voices. Okay, so yes, I'm, I'm Ethan Duke, and as Dana mentioned, I'm a co-founder and uh, assistant director for the observatory. Um, I've been seriously into birds for about 20 years, and was more of a, a kind of naturalist, I guess, at the beginning, um, like y'all. And uh, then I, I really got into, um, I guess, birding seriously when I was in the UK, I was stationed over there. Um, and then I just sort of like fell into the this thing of studying birds. But um, like like Dana, I gained a little variety of field experience and, and uh, traveled around in New York studying grassland birds and and wild turkeys and then I spent some time in the UP of Michigan studying American red starts and studied cerulean warblers for a few uh, seasons in, in uh, Tennessee and uh, pileated woodpeckers in Arkansas and uh, uh, did some some other work up in Wyoming um, so I've gotten to see a, a few varieties of habitats as well, um, but one thing that I've really, really been into, really passionate about is um, avian, you know, vocal communication. And so I, I'll pay attention to time here, but I, I'm just going to take in a brief, albeit deep dive into that little niche, into that, uh, that little corner of studying ornithology. And I'll, I'll show you a few resources, maybe kick open the door and a few new, new perspectives for you looking at birds. Um, but where do we even begin? You know, how do you even begin really taking that kind of plunge in the deep dive in the specialized topic? Um, so I just thought, well, let's take a good example bird and just go with it. And let's say, I wanna know more about this bird. And so this beautiful bird here, is a photo by uh, Julia Analak, who, who took this photo for our photo contest, but what a gorgeous striking bird it is. And Dana showed it earlier in her presentation there. And this is a white crowned sparrow, kind of a unique sparrow in that it, uh, you, know, you can see by this white crown that it's an actually a full adult in their first year wintering here in Missouri, uh, they'll have a brown crown, but um, this one's obviously on its second trip. And um, so, so um, perhaps you've heard its song. And one of the cool things about this bird is you can hear its song in the wintertime. Um, so, so who would want to just like listen to this song? You know, um, I'm going to play it and you'll hear it. And um, you'll also hear maybe brown thrasher, definitely some northern cardinals in there. But it's got the really the loudest sound that you'll hear in this. What a nice bird to take its song and come down and sing to us in the wintertime when all these other birds just stop singing and they, they just leave us, you know? But that bird sticks around. It comes down here and it sings. But this whole, this is a big, Donald Kruzma once described this as the uh, black hole. He says, he, I wrote to him once and he said, welcome to the black hole bird song. And um, so he wrote this book, which received a Burroughs Award. It's called The Art and Science, or uh, Singing Life of Birds, The Art and Science of Listening to Birdsong. And I'd say if you want to get into this, you'll likely, if you want to get into birdsong, you'll likely really enjoy this book. He also takes you on a deeper dive if you want to get the ecology and evolution of avian communication uh, by him and, and a guy named Miller. And um, I think he was from Newfoundland. But um, yeah, you, when you, you know, th this will really open up this world to you. It's just fascinating to learn about um, the, the science of listening to birdsong. And uh, I just recommend it. Um, 
but if if you want those questions you know how many songs does white crown sparrow sing um uh, why does it sing this song uh, do all of them sound the same you know if you have these questions about that um some of those answers might be right at your fingertips with the resources dana mentioned earlier like this one birds of the world this is cornell lab of ornithology's encyclopedia of birds it's it has all the benefits you would think of your classic encyclopedia like your encyclopedia britannica um only it's a living document and it's updated by you know these scientists update these species accounts regularly so it's and, and then also you have all the community science out there eBird, where citizens are collecting bird data people are taking photos recording birds so they have this huge media trove that's curated by the cornell lab that helps feed into this giant encyclopedia helps power their range maps and gives just the best information you can find right away. This big one, Birds of the World, as Dana mentioned, used to be called Birds of North America, um, is, is really pretty in depth and it requires a, a, a subscription. They do have a trial version of it, I believe. So you might wanna do that. But um, if, if you're not quite ready for that, or if you wanna check out the Cliff version, Cliff Notes version, there is that one too that Dana mentioned earlier, right there. Um, so how do these two stack up? I'll just go over it kind of briefly here. And you can see that the birds of the world has that has this really comprehensive species account over here. Dana mentioned these categories. Um, the, the, uh, there's a couple more broader categories with all about birds. They have you know, a general overview, ID, helpful ID info. You know, this one's a free one. So you can jump on that at any time looking at ID, life history information, range maps, and sounds. Um, not quite as in-depth, but still have some pretty neat things. Um, you notice over here, they also have a little section that says, you wanna learn more, go to Birds of the World. So there's that. Um, it also has some cool facts. I mean, check these out. So I pulled these species accounts up for the uh, white crowned sparrow and uh, we can see some interesting things. Like this one says, a young male white crowned sparrow learns the basics of songs it will sing as an adult during the first two or three months of its life. It does not learn directly from its father, but rather from generalized song environment of its natal neighborhood. So there's that. There's some interesting migratory factoids that they have in there. And then there's scientists interested in movement and uh, energetics have discovered how well they can perform on a treadmill. So I don't know who determines these factoids is cool or not, you know, Maybe it's not somebody that's super cool themselves. I don't think it's that cool, to, you know, bird on a treadmill, you know, but you never know. It takes all kinds. So uh, I digress. Um, we can we can take a take a look at this. I'm this birds of the world in general. I mean, I, I just look at it every time I'm like, oh, la, la, look at these great resources right at my fingertips. I can jump right into the taxonomy stuff Dana was talking about. You can see it in the upper right hand corner. I can see the closely related birds. And I'll tell you, take a little deeper dive. I, I would know, I can read into this and say, oh, I know the subspecies of white crowned sparrow that's most closely related to the golden crowned sparrow. You know, those that evolved most recently uh, with that species. So um, you can find great um, range maps in here as well, and the great media. They have uh, information on all these birds' names. You can see over here on the left, the uh, 31 names. <laughs> and you can look at all the, the subspecies, which are, are, excuse me, which are five. Uh, and then they have information on their, their, uh, the, their uh, conservation sort of status. Um, here they say, least concern, you know, whatever that means. I mean, I, I, know, what, I know what it means, but what if all the bird populations out there were really good and this bird was labeled as least concern? Okay, now what if all the bird populations were really struggling and this bird was labeled least concern? Are they still the same? I don't know. It's kind of so subjective, but I prefer the partners in flight conservation value scores personally, but um, I know where the IEC gets these, these numbers and I, it's a good system. I'm just I kind of doing a thought exercise on it. Um, but I digress again, we're gonna jump into this deep dive here with, with the white crown sparrow. As Dana mentioned, look at all these great categories that we've got here. 
Um, we're looking at sounds and vocal behavior. Um, we could jump into geographic variation under the systematics tab, but right now we're just gonna look at some song stuff and, and see what they have. Well, on uh, White Crown Sparrow, there happens to be a lot. I chose White Crown Sparrow because it's a great example species for studying vocalizations. There's been a lot of really good work done on this bird species. So um, let's see what the, uh, the account says in, in general here. If, you, if you're quick on sound, there's a lot of text there. They also have a really nice uh, uh, figure there. Oftentimes there's more than one nice figure associated with these species accounts. Here's a general synopsis under sound, songs. And they'll, they'll show you that um, all these studies relating to uh, bird song are in here. They're, they're highlighted, you can click on them, you can go to the source paper. So what I do is I highlight them find that source paper, instantly go search online for those papers sometimes, even get more in depth on, on these things. But um, that's, that's like the, the rabbit holes in ornithology are endless that way, or seemingly endless. Uh, but it's really a fascinating way to approach it. And, and uh, just like the Cliff Notes explained and that uh, uh, the other platform there all about birds, they say, in, in a di in different lexicon, but they say the same thing, uh, that white crown sparrows are early learning sensitive period, um, learn from the general neighborhood, um, and that's when they start memorizing their songs, and it's only for a few months of age, and then after that they don't really memorize anymore. Um, and, and they further go into, you know, migratory subspecies follow a little different system than those that are, um, uh, are resident or short-term migrants. And so that, that lack of small scale dialect structure is attributable to long distance migratory habits of a couple of those subspecies like gamble eye and uh, leucophries. So, hmm. Migrants don't learn local dialects uh, like the residents will. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Why does it behoove you to learn all these dialects of your neighbors if you're just going to be moving around quite a bit anyway? So that's interesting, um, just in general, that even if you don't understand all that, that white crown sparrows, they just don't all sound the same. So that answers one of our questions right there. They don't all sound the same. And then over on the right, they had this really cool diagram of the various songs of the subspecies there. And so you're looking at this, the visual representation of bird sound. And these are different subspecies stacked on top of each other, A through E. And wow, that's, that's pretty neat. So these different subspecies have a tendency to sound differently. Whatever those processes that are driving that, that's kind of a fact. Um, so not only if we knew what subspecies we may have heard here in Missouri. Well, let's jump over real quick to another resource that you, if you're into birds, you're gonna know and love. Um, I sure do. It's called Xenocanto. It's filled with bird recordings from birds all over the world. So we, we can, uh, there's professional recordists on here. There's amateur recordists, but everybody's this is a really well curated collection of bird songs of the world. It's just absolutely phenomenal resources. So I'll, I'll put in White Crown Sparrow, look them up. I already did that. I've got a screenshot for you right here. And here we can see on the right, Gamble Eye, Gamble Eye question mark. We're not sure. Leucophries, uh, Leucophies, we, we're looking at Nettle Eye, Oriantha. All these different subspecies of white crowned sparrow are represented of these colors on these map of bird recordings that are out there. Well, there's a surprising kind of dearth of them in the middle of the country. There's not a lot of them. Um, but what we do see are these leucophies. So leucophies are the birds, if you look at this range map here, which is really brilliant. They, they use data from BirdLife International and NatureServe and help, help further refine these subspecies in range maps. But this red right up here, that's all leucophies. These green guys over here on, a, on the west coast, those are gamble eye. And oftentimes these subspecies over on the coast, they might migrate down to you know, California 
or and stick really to the coast and not really come too far inland sometimes. And some of them come out a little bit more close to us and they can show up as, as vagrants. If you look at uh, Mark Robbins, his latest book, uh, and counts of birds in Missouri, they, they, they'll note that there's a couple of these Western species that will show up, in, especially in Western Missouri. Um, so let's see, how can we figure this out? Well, I clicked on a little dot here and boom, there's a recording in Missouri of a bird. And hey, I took that recording right by our house in 2015. And uh, let's look at the sound spectrogram of that bird and see what's going on with it. Hey, it happens to be that recording we were listening to earlier. And let's pull it up right next to that Birds of the World wonderful figure and see what's going on. Hmm. Let's may play a matching game with this. What subspecies might it be? Well, the first note on the recording is pretty long, pretty flat. I did a little bit more, more reading in there, and they said a lot of the dialects show up at the end things that are trills. You can kind of see these fuzzy, buzzy things on the, the right-hand side of the sound spectrogram. And a lot of the dialect stuff you can find in there. So I didn't jump right over and compare those as well. You know, oh, wow. It's, it's kind of, even in an untrained eye, I would say A or B probably. It's probably an A or B. So I look over on a chart, A or B says it's Lucophis or Gamble Eye. Well, shocker. Hey, at least we now know you can go out there, record your white crowned sparrows, and probably have a pretty good idea what subspecies, where they came from, just by their song. So that's that that's just an amazing thing, isn't it? Like, you know, you don't even a lot of guys. I talked to Paul McKenzie or emailed with him recently, who's a great ornithologist in Missouri, retired fish and wildlife service guy. And I asked him, I said, hey, Paul. What about, um, what's your confidence level that most of these white crowned sparrows are going to be leucophies? He's like, absolutely. And, you know, he's like, there's still these gamble eyes and these other ones. And there's this other sort of species you have to think about that's not easily identifiable. And most people out there looking at them aren't looking that closely at their plumages and their morphology to, to and, and have the expertise to be able to get them down to that. But I, I don't even have that great expertise to really judge the size of their lores, you know, the area by their eyebrows and stuff, I, and their crown stripes, I don't know. I just stick a record, put my iPhone out there and record them, and maybe maybe then uh, I'll just look at their recordings and, and be able to see. So it's amazing to think about these birds and how quickly or not quickly they may, may change. What they found is white crown sparrows are pretty stable in their dialects. Unlike white-throated sparrows, which white-throated sparrows seem to have really changed a lot really quickly. That old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody uh, thing that people would say that they, they sang is changing up in, in the last uh, couple decades. And that, that all is because of their evolutionary history. If we think way back, you know, a little bit more recent after that extinction event with the pterodactyls, and you get a little bit more recent than Archaeopteryx lithographica, which was 170 million years ago, a little bit more recent than the Cenozoic, right about the Cenozoic, that one extinction period that came in there, the birds were, they were evolving that whole time. And then more, then right about that Miocene era, you know, maybe 60, 90 million years ago, the earth was a lot different. It was, it was, you know, our continents were a lot different, that is. We, you know, it wasn't until the last hundred million years that Africa started peeling off of, you know, the Americas. And so these birds were evolving even in those times. And of course it was an incredibly long period of time. So you can think about all the little changes that happened there. Dana showed the, the similarities in those thrushes. If you think about those thrushes in the last 12 million years when the, the wood thrush and the, the robin split out from the wood thrush and the sister species of thrushes and how they had different migratory patterns or residency patterns, different ecologies and different factors and different learning processes of their songs that made them express their song. So you can go forward in history, you can go backward in history, and you can use bird song to help unravel that mystery of how they came to be. So those are that's generally a, a good quick quick dive into it, and um, 
I I think that we we I just I'll kind of sum it up here and open up for more questions I guess but um, we've learned a lot about birds uh, through their avian communication and yet we still have a lot more to learn you can see that there's a lot of holes in the map here for Missouri I mean it, you all could go out there and, and get some recordings and and see for yourselves you know generate some sound spectrograms on some some free software and, and maybe figure that out that mystery. Maybe that could be a, a, a project for somebody um, or could be another species. I just think it's really cool that there's a, there's a species that you can work on with birdsong in the winter time. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying that would maybe contribute a lot to conservation, but maybe, you know, understanding subspecies I think is very important metric. It's a fine scale metric of biodiversity. And, that's kind of our, our end goal here is to conserve biodiversity. So um, not all species develop the songs the same way, but uh, their processes are unique, their ecology is unique and their evolutionary history is unique. And uh, that's, that's it for that deep, deep dive. Anybody have any uh, questions? So have you noticed impacts of human soundscapes on the bird songs? That's been, Really an interesting, that's a great question. Um, yes. <laughs> um, the scientists, and when I first started getting into bird song, scientists had already found out some, some amazing things. I remember the first papers I saw were from Spain. And then there's, since then, there's been great um, studies in, in Idaho and elsewhere, um, looking at the effects of uh, anthropomorphic human disturbance uh, on the soundscape. So you think about all the sounds of the environment and how that may impact birds. You know, maybe it's not even just sound sometimes that impacts birds. I remember I spent years in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'd, I'd be working in restaurants or whatever, and I'd walk back at night and it'd be, you know, one o'clock in the morning after cleaning a kitchen and I could still hear the Warabin singing because the street lights in downtown Knoxville kept them singing. So it wasn't such a dreary walk home. Um, and they seemed, I don't know if that harmed them or not, but they seem there every year and they seem to be okay if they found a good place to nest successfully with their 35, 40% nest success rate or whatever it is for cub nesters. Um, also the, the anthropomorphic sounds definitely seem to affect birds in some of those Idaho studies and the studies in Spain. Um, and, and I can imagine, especially in the early development, it would affect them. I've often wondered how much our prairie chickens in Missouri had a compounding effect of their soundscape as well as the habitat um, degradation and fragmentation and loss of habitat. Uh, I think about some of those great leks that used to exist down by coal camp and high lonesome area, and they got 65 rolling right through there with the increase of vehicles and traffic and the sound of those. I wonder how much, especially if it's a low frequency hum, hum, hum of traffic and low frequency boons of prairie chickens at 200 hertz or whatnot, I'm sure that that probably has a, a cumulative effect. I think they're looking at those types of effects and um, the sage grouse as well out west with the fragmentation combined with maybe the sounds of things as well as sounds of wind turbines and things um, on, on those critters out west. So great question. Yeah, there's probably a lot of impacts there. And, and it, since you're a master naturalist and you're not just stuck with birds, um, that's a big problem with marine life. Cetaceous creatures like whales and things are, have been really affected by naval exercises as well as uh, uh, big shipping traffic affecting their, their acoustic communication in the oceans. Did you hear that? Nope. Okay, so this is someone who's moved from Texas, and when they moved here, they noticed certain birds have different dialects, and um, what, how that, um, oh, okay, so is it different dialects among regions like we would have, or is it more a subspecies yeah. between here and there? Yeah. Um... The dialectal thing um, varies by species. There are some interesting studies not too long ago done out in Kanza Prairie in that area out close by us on dick thistles. 
and um, they 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 found that they would have a lot of different dialects, but it wasn't a big factor on things like their aggression or their territoriality or their breeding and gene flow. In other species, that's not the case, and so it's more attached to um, you know that kind of subspecies thing. It just depends on the evolutionary history of those species. And keep in mind that just like people, um, you know, birds learn their, the, the singing birds, the songbirds learn their songs. Now there's a whole other group of birds, the subocenes, that have their song encoded in their DNA, like um, the ty tyrant flycatchers and those primitive birds Dana was talking about, um, that's, in, that's encoded. They don't do a whole lot of song learning. And then further, remember, just like people, um, birds in Texas just sound funny. <laughs> There's a lot of nodding with that one. <laughs> we love y'all. Other questions? Yeah, Jesse. We just wanted to ask about my birds. Your thoughts on the iBird? It's a, a Apple. Apple. I like it. I like okay. I like iBird. I like them all. I like Sibley a lot, but I don't know. What do you? What do you? Dana and Paige, what do you think? What do you like? I most often use Sibley, the new version, um, because you can compare two species at once. I like that a lot for apps. Um, but I like iBird. Sometimes it's helpful to have the pictures on there and it has fun facts. Um, but I, my big recommendation for beginners is Merlin ID because it's free and it kind of walks you through kind of what Dana walked you through. Like, oh, you got to look at size and then location and like different things like that. And so that can be kind of helpful as well. <laughs> I like books. Um, one thing that is really awesome about apps, though, is that, as Ethan just spoke about the incredible variation in song by subspecies and, of course, cross species, if you are in the field and you hear a bird and you think, huh, that kind of sounds like this or that, the whole identification by sight where you're like, hey, this kind of looks like a cardinal, maybe it's in the cardinal family, or this kind of looks like a robin, maybe it's in the robin family, that does actually work for song as well in a lot of cases. And so then you can pull out your app and be like, okay, I'm pretty sure this is a thrush of some kind, so I'm going to play songs on my app. And I have found that to be incredibly helpful. Oh, oh, you just reminded me. Um... I wanted to use this graphic, but I was afraid uh, afraid to plagiarize. Plagiarize. It was a one from Potos, and as a paper he and somebody else did, and they had a graphic of all of Darwin's finches. So what a classic study of evolution, the Darwin's the beak of the finches. But they had the sound spectrograms right next to all the beak sizes, and so if you have a big honking seed eating beak. You can't you can't move it up and down rapidly, and you can't you know make the frequency modulations quite as extreme as those little little birds can. So, and if ever you see a little wren sitting there with his little beak and making these big loud sounds and really changing it up and rocking the house, and you're like, how does he do that? Well, it's because he's he can move it faster. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of neat. And um, uh, one more thing I'll throw in there. So after break, and you can digest this one, um, and, and, and Paige will kind of pick up on it, is that birds' physiology and their evolution of their morphology is so internal as well. Um, their, their sound production has to do with their breathing and their lungs and their air sacs. And so they have you know, left and right searing so they can harmonize with themselves at two different frequencies at once. And they do this as they're breathing. So it's, it's really interesting how their voices are so closely connected to their physiology. Hey, I think we're good to go. All right, thank you so much, Wendy. Um, hi, everybody. So uh, we're gonna switch gears a little bit uh, and focus on what's going on inside the bird's body a little bit more. 
Um, but before I kind of get into that, I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit. Uh, so my name is Paige Wittick, and I'm the education coordinator um, working with Dana and Ethan at the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Uh, I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, which you can kind of tell by the way I say Wisconsin. Um, and I went to school at the University of Wisconsin in Madison studying zoology and environmental studies. Um, and while in college and afterwards, worked at a variety of different wildlife organizations and sanctuaries from you know wildlife rehab and a little bit of environmental education work. And then in 2017, I made the trek to Missouri to work for the Missouri River Bird Observatory starting as a seasonal educator. And I've been with them ever since. Um, so I think it's been like four or five years now, I forget. <laughs> um, and I think birds are awesome and you're about to find out why. <laughs> so we're going to talk, or you already kind of have found out why, but here's even more reasons. <laughs> um, so anatomy and physiology. So I'm telling this is the briefest of overviews because a lot of what we're talking about today, uh, I, I learned and I assume Dana and Ethan learned over like a long period of time. Um, and a lot of these topics, you know, they go, I like, I learned it over a whole semester um, in college. And so we're trying to like, I'm going to pick a few things that I find most interesting about avian anatomy and physiology. Um, but Ethan remind, reminded me like, oh my gosh, there are just so many other cool things that we could talk about. Um, so I'm going to talk kind of fast about this speed and I apologize for that. Um, I kind of had this dilemma of, okay, am I going to talk a little bit faster and cover more stuff? or talk slower and cover less stuff. And I guess I decided to cover more stuff. So I apologize if it's a little fast. Um, I can send um, anybody who's interested my PowerPoint with the presenter notes that'll have a lot of what I'm about to say on them. So if you don't catch something, you can get it from that. So first we're gonna cover the avian respiratory system. So this is one of the first things that really got me interested in birds. I my interest in birds started in college. I took a class called Extinction of Species and the professor was an ornithologist and he would come in and say, birds are awesome. And then he would continue about whatever we were talking about for Extinction of Species. And I was like, okay, like, cool. I don't really get it. Like they fly, that's kind of cool. Uh, they're cute, like, but like, what's the big deal? Um, so I took an ornithology class um, and this was one of the things that just like blew my mind and really like opened up my fascination with birds is how they breathe. I just think it's super cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and to really make sure we understand how awesome birds breathing is, I did wanna go over how we, we humans and mammals breathe too. Um, so our respiratory system is made up primarily of our lungs and our windpipe. Um, and we have it because our cells need oxygen to react with the glucose to create energy that we need to do all of our daily tasks like birding. Um, so we get the oxygen to ourselves through the respiratory system and then via the circulatory system, which we'll also talk about later. Um, so when we breathe in, we are using a muscle called the diaphragm and it flattens out making our lungs expand and fill with air. And when we breathe in, air gets forced in through our nose and our mouth, down our windpipe and into bronchi tubes in our lungs. And these bronchi tubes branch out and get smaller and smaller and smaller like roots or branches of a tree. And at the very end of these roots or branches are something called al alveoli. I think it's how it's said, I always mess it up. Um, and it's kind of, there's kind of a lot of L's or something in there. It makes it kind of hard, hard to pronounce but they're the end of the smallest branches of these bronchi and they have are tiny air sacs. And what they do is they have a very thin one cell thick wall that allows the oxygen to be passed to red blood cells as they're passing by. So this is where um, uh, they're the end point of the respiratory system. So this is where that oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged in the, in the bloodstream. And there are hundreds of millions of these tiny little structures in our lungs. So that's breathing in. And then when we breathe out, those alveoli also help clean out waste gas from our blood cells. And that waste gas is carbon dioxide or CO2, which you probably already know. We breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2. And when we do that, our diaphragm bows up and pushes the air back out, getting rid of the carbon dioxide. 
And this makes room for fresh air with new oxygen to come back into on our next breath. So this is a graphic that's gonna kind of show you what that looks like. So the yellow being the CO2 and the pinkish color being, or sorry, the yellow being the oxygen and that pinkish color being the CO2. So we breathe in oxygen and then we breathe out carbon dioxide. And this is kind of like a one-way system. So we're getting an oxygen and then we go out CO2. So I just want you to kind of remember that as we're talking about how it works in birds, um, which is way cooler. So the function of the respiratory system is the same for birds, but the avian respiratory system is physically distinct from our mammalian respiratory system, both in structure and in its ability to exchange gas as efficiently as possible. So the structures, we'll go over some of the structures, how they're a little bit different. So um, they have relatively small lungs compared to ours, um, but respiration is more efficient. And that's largely to do to these structures called air sacs, which are found only in birds. Um, and there they have what's called a parabronchus, which is a equivalent and it's spelled wrong here, but the alveoli in humans. Um, so that's where that gas exchange occurs. And in that parabronchus, there's a much larger overall surface area than what's found in us. And this allows more oxygen and carbon dioxide to be passed between the blood and the tissues. And so that results in more efficient breathing, but that's not all in terms of efficiency. So um, every, with every breath of oxygen rich inhaled air, it remains in the respiratory system for two complete inhalation and exhalation cycles before it is fully spent and used and exhaled out of the body. Um, and if that's confusing, that's okay. I'm gonna explain how that works kind of step-by-step step because it's really cool. So first inhalation. So the bird's breathing in, the fresh air is first inhaled through the bird's nares, and then it travels down the trachea, which is a large tube extending from the throat. And the trachea splits into left and right primary bronchi. The inhaled air travels down each of those bronchi and then divides. And this same, um, some air enters the lungs where the gas exchange occurs, while the remaining air fills the rear ear sac air sacs, or in this graphic, it'd be the posterior air sacs. So it's kind of, which eat, with this first breath in, some air is going into the lungs for gas exchange and some of it's going into these air sacs. Then the first time they breathe out, the fresh air in those rear air sacs or the posterior air sacs enters the lungs and undergoes gas exchange. And the spent air in the lungs is displaced by this incoming air into the lungs and flows out of the body through the trachea. So we're breathing in, it goes lungs, air sacs, then we breathe out, the air in the air sacs goes into the lungs and the lungs goes out. Then in the second time they breathe in, the fresh air again enters both the rear air sacs and the lungs. But the spent air in the lungs is again displaced by the incoming air, but it can't exit through the trachea because fresh air is flowing inward. So that air instead goes into, or the carbon dioxide goes into the front air sacs or the anterior air sacs. Then, so that's the second breathing in. So we've got air in the, we've got, uh, CO2 in the anterior air sacs, we've got gas exchange happening in the lungs, and we've got air in the posterior air sacs. And then the second time they breathe out, the spent air in the front air sacs um, and in the lungs flows out through the trachea, and the fresh air in the rear air sacs enters the lungs for gas exchange. So this is kind of uh, what this graphic is going to look like. Um, so this is a, this efficiency is part of what makes bird flight possible because birds must be capable of really high rates of gas exchange because their oxygen consumption at rest is higher than that of all other vertebrates, including us mammals, and it increases even more during flight. So you can kind of see, you know, the air is going in through here and into the lungs. And then it goes into, you know, and how it kind of flows throughout the bird's body. But what I really want you to pay attention to is this zoomed in graphic of the lungs. So you can see that there's near constant gas exchange happening, meaning there's almost a constant, there's a constant supply of oxygen flowing through the lungs and being turned into CO2 and therefore going through the body. So this makes it extra efficient versus our breathing in and then breathing out.
they have a constant exchange of gas, which is part of what makes it um, so efficient. And so that's the respiratory system and that's only the beginning. There's still so much more to cover. We could talk about how their structure of their bones lead to more air volume and efficiency, how the action of their flapping aids in a bird's breathing and how all of that helps them to belt out those loud songs that Ethan was talking about, even as they're flying through the air. Um, but there probably isn't enough time to fully cover how that works. But I've hoped I've sparked your curiosity so you can look into a little bit more um, or you know, we can talk at a different time about that because obviously I find it really fascinating. Um, but now we're gonna talk a little bit about, so great, you have more oxygen exchange, but how do you get that throughout the body? Because that's where you need it. You need it in your cells. Um, so um, they have these really high oxygen demands um, so their respiratory system is more efficient, but it also um, has a more efficient circulatory system to be able to get that oxygen to the uh, bird cells where it needs it. So um, one kind of thing um, is birds <laughs> that difference than ours is that their heart size. So it is a general rule in nature that smaller animals have larger hearts in proportion to their body size and faster hearts, right, heart rates. So the size of the heart um, also can depend on the amount of aerobic energy each species expends. So for example, a large bird like a swan will proportionally have a smaller heart for its size than a racing pigeon. Um, and the relatively large hearts of birds may be necessary to meet the high blood supply needed during flight. So hummingbirds have the largest hearts of all birds relative to their body size and mass because of the large amounts of energy used when hovering. Hovering is one of the most energetically costly flights, um, but it allows those birds to sip nectar um, and do some really cool stuff. Um, but they need a big heart to be able to pump all that blood fast enough. So the next thing I kind of want to talk about is heart rate um, of birds. So we're talking about resting heart rate. So this means, you know, just kind of as they're chilling. Um, and by heart rate, I mean like beats per minute. So I'm going to do some comparisons here. So humans, our resting heart rate is between 60 and 100. Um, dogs, very similar to ours, which I think is kind of cute. Theirs is about 60 to 160, depending on you know, the size of your dog. Um, cats, 160 to 180. Crows, we see this huge jump. So almost more than three times our resting heart rate are crows. Then house sparrows, even more, almost more than four times. And then we see a huge jump when we're talking about the ruby-throated hummingbird. So almost more than six times our resting heart rate, um, that heart is beating to be able to get that blood throughout its body. And another way to kind of think about this and measure this is through cardiac output. Um, so birds' hearts tend to pump more blood per unit time than human hearts. And that's what cardiac output is. Um, and it's influenced by both heart rate, so beats per minute, um, and what we call stroke volume, which means blood, the amount of blood pumped with each beat. And um, this, uh, the reason for this is again, because of the large amounts of blood supply needed during flight. So birds have a highly efficient circulatory and respiratory system. And these are two pieces of the puzzle of how birds are able to fly like they do. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about bird flight. Um, and how that works. <laughs> so ever since there were people, people have watched birds fly and wondered how they did it, wondering also too if they could fly. Um, but only in the 20th century have people been able to build machines that can fly through the air. Um, and they did so after carefully studying birds. The birds, however, do a better job in many ways than we do with our airplanes. Um, and that's because birds are built for flight. So kind of as I've been talking about so far, they have a lot of different adaptations. Um, their bones are hollow and light, but strong. They have light feathers, which catch the air. Their respiratory system is extra efficient at extracting oxygen from the air. Their circulatory system gets that oxygen to their cells extra efficiently. Um, every aspect of bird from head to toe, inside out, evolved to aid in aerodynamics. So let's talk a little bit more about how all that actually works and kind of comes together. Um, so birds master four major forces um, of flight in order to flap their wings overhead. Lift, thrust, weight or gravity, and drag. <laughs> and 
part of what they're able to do that is because of the shape, how they're able to get that lift um, is because of the shape of their wings. So objects which fly and have wings get lift from the shape and bird wings have an airfoil shape. That's what we kind of call this like different lengths, um, which creates this unequal length at the top and the bottom of the wing. <laughs> and that top surface of the wing is curved upward and longer than the bottom surface of the wing. And so as air hits the leading edge of the wing, it's deflected over and under the wing. And the air deflected over the top of the wing takes longer to rejoin the air deflected under, creating a pressure difference. <laughs> and so an area of high pressure is created below the wing and an area of low pressure is created above the wing, which in turn produces lift. And in order for an object to overcome gravity, the amount of force created by lift must be greater than that created by gravity. But how, so, but how do we get this kind of force, this movement of air over the wing? Well, we need thrust. So it's required to move the object forward fast enough to overcome that drag, which is the force go, going, so friction basically, um, to help create that lift. So like we discussed, the object in flight must be moving fast enough for the air to deflect around the wings and create the pressure difference required for lift. And birds get this thrust from flapping their wings. So they, objects that fly essentially must create enough thrust to overcome drag and initiate lift and enough lift to overcome gravity. So basically there's a lot of physics involved. I remember at my ornithology class, one student had mentioned how they were, took ornithology to get away from physics for a little bit. And my ornithology professor kind of laughed because there was a lot of physics involved and that largely has to do with studying how birds fly. Um, and all of those different adaptations we have been talking about allow the bird to create enough thrust to overcome drag and create enough lift to overcome gravity. Um, because all of these different things have to work together um, cohesively for that bird to be able to do what no other animal really can do. <laughs> Some other animals can fly, but not quite like birds can. <laughs> um, and what's also really cool and fascinating is that not all birds fly in the same way. Most birds use some combination of gliding and flapping to get up into the air um, and stay there. And there are different kinds of flight. And this largely depends on the bird's wing shape. So I wanna talk a little bit about some different bird wing shapes essentially, um, and some really cool bird flying abilities. <laughs> so we have to talk about the peregrine falcon. And I'm gonna guess that a lot of you probably already know this as one of the fastest animals in the world. Um, so as you may have guessed, uh, peregrine falcons have what we call high speed wings. So these wings are long and thin and they typically have some sort of like notch in them like you can see here. Um, and as their name suggests, birds with this wing type are incredibly fast flyers. So peregrine falcons hunt prey from high in the air and then make a spectacular dive with speeds up to 240 miles per hour to strike prey and capture them in flight, which is just like, Really cool. Another type of wing that you might be familiar with is called passive soaring wings. So these are on birds called like turkey vultures. These are on like bald eagles and some hawks. And they have the ability to soar high in the sky for long periods of time with very little energy use. So very little flapping action. And that's largely due to these really large wings and what we call kind of high aspect, uh, aspect ratio. Um, so as you may know, like turkey vultures, they hunt for carrion or dead stuff by soaring high in the sky with large wide wings in a dihedral or V-shape. And they take advantage of rising air currents, so kind of thermal, so rising hot air off the earth um, to be able to just kind of float up and get really high and stay up high um, with very using very little energy. Um, I often say that, you know, if I were to pick what bird to be, I often pick the turkey vulture because, you know, you can fly and see the world so high up um, with very little energy and, you know, you can eat whatever you want without getting sick because you have really high stomach acid, which we could talk about. I could do a whole presentation on turkey vultures. They're so awesome, but I digress. We don't really have time. <laughs> um, so what birds have that allows them to fly like no other, they have flight feathers, um, so wing and tail feathers. They have an airfoil shape to their wings. They're light but durable skeletal system. 
Um, they have strong flight muscles that attach to this special bone called the keel. So these are all things we didn't really get to cover as much, um, but they're all part of what bir allows birds to fly. Um, also, they have a digestive system that works quickly and doesn't have a lot of heavy organs like ours does. Um, they have a highly efficient respiratory system, which we talked about, a highly efficient circulatory system, which we talked about, and so many other detailed things that we may not even understand completely yet. Um, so there's a lot that goes into allowing them to be able to lift off into the air. Okay. The last thing that I'm going to talk about is bird vision, because um, I think this is uh, a really cool aspect of avian anatomy and physiology, um, and also something that you can kind of, uh, kind of ties into other things that we're going to talk about later. Um, so there are a variety of different aspects of bird vision and bird eyes that we could talk about, but I'm going to focus on one aspect that I personally find super fascinating about bird vision which is their ability to see an ultraviolet light. So let me explain what that is, how it works, and how scientists discovered it. Um, so the electromagnetic spectrum, um, it's the range of wavelengths for, or frequencies over which electromagnetic radiation extends. But don't get like too caught up with that definition if you don't quite understand what that means. Um, just kind of know that all electromagnetic radiation is light but we can only see a small portion of this radiation, the portion we call visible light here, um, because cone-shaped cells in our eyes act as receivers tuned to the wavelengths in this narrow band of the spectrum. Other portions of the spectrum have wavelengths either too large or too small and energetic for the biological limitations of our perception. So we can't, we can't quite tune into those other wavelengths, although they exist. But birds and other creatures can see outside of the visible light spectrum into the even shorter wavelengths of the ultraviolet spectrum or UV rays, sometimes you'll, re you'll hear them referred to as. So how did we discover this? Because like, we can't see an ultraviolet light. So how did we discover that birds could? So in the early 1970s, a researcher testing the ability of pigeons to discriminate colors discovered by accident that the birds can see in ultraviolet light. The finding was deemed curious, but not too important at the time. It was natural for a scientist to assume that bird vision is like human vision. After all, birds and humans are both active by day. We use bright colors as cues. Um, and no one, no one really imagined birds might see the world differently. Um, but during the following decades, systematic uh, testing of bird vision revealed something unexpected, which is that many bird species, not just pigeons, can see in UV light. Indeed, with the exception of night flying birds, such as owls, the eyes of most birds probably are even more sensitive to ultraviolet light than they are to what we call visible light. So scientists have learned that many birds have plumage that reflects UV light, plumage or feathers. Um, that reflects that UV light. And so together, these discoveries made us realize that there could be new answers to old questions. So birds rely on vision to choose mates, find food, scan for predators. And so, um, for example, like if you assume birds see exactly what we see, you could have the wrong framework for understanding why a bird might be behaving a certain way. So it kind of like opened up this whole new thing, like, oh my gosh, they can see in UV light. Maybe there's a different reason that they're doing this instead of what we previously thought. Um, so, you know, it kind of threw that world of ornithology wide open at the time. And um, those preconceived notions about where, why birds behaved in certain ways would have to be rethought. So um, during the past uh, three or so decades, a flurry of studies have tested the intriguing notion that mate choice and other birds' behaviors may be sh shaped by these secret visual signals that we humans can't see. Um, uh, and what kind of facilitated this explosion of research was that the technology got better and cheaper, which is something that we're gonna see is kind of a theme throughout like scientific study. So in particular, the increased availability and decreased cost of a lab device called the spectro spectrophotometer or photom Photometer, I don't know how you would say it, which precisely measures light reflected or absorbed by a surface. So it lets scientists, if not see like a bird, at least kind of quantify what birds might be seeing. Um, 
And in 2005, an ornithologist used a spectra from spectro, I don't know why I'm having so much trouble saying this word, but spectrophotometer um, to scan the feathers of museum study specimens of 139 songbird species in which males and females appear alike to us human eyes. So they studied like cedar waxwings, barn swallows, mockingbirds, western meadowlarks, all kinds of different species. And so scientists had previously classified these birds um, along with 70% of all songbird species as what we call sexually monochromatic, which means males and females look identical. And a full 90% of the species they scanned actually were sexually dichromatic, which means males and females look different once you took into account the better discrimination of colors that included um, the ultraviolet um, by birds and the amount of UV light the feathers reflected. So to the birds themselves, the males and the females look quite different from one another, even though our eyes can't perceive these changes, which I think is super cool. So how do birds use this power of UV vision? Um, in a lot of different ways. <laughs> Um, so scientists are investigating whether uh, UV signals can play a role after eggs hatch. Um, so think about uh, like bird parents and they're trying to like, they have find these, all these different caterpillars and all these different insects um, and feeding this like nest full of hungry chicks. So which chick get, gets fed first? Um, so in some species, parents cue in on a hatchling size or how loudly and energetically it begs but color can also be a factor. The brightness of the gape or the edge of the mouth, so this kind of yellow part in this picture here, or the head um, seems to stimulate a parent to pro offer food. And some researchers are suggesting that UV color may enhance this effect of the birds. So basically like the, I think the thought is like the ones that are reflecting less UV light um, or more UV light need more food. And so the parents are feeding them first, which I think is really interesting, but they're still kind of studying um, whether this might not play, might or might not play a role, which I think is cool. Um, they also may rely on UV signals when they're off finding food. Um, so many insects, including moths and butterflies have body coatings that strongly reflect UV light. Um, many seeds are also reflective. And berries and fruits develop a highly reflective waxy coating um, as they ripen. Um, so on the other hand, most green leaves do not reflect UV light. So even if a red berry seems quite visible against a green leaf to human eyes, for the birds, this contrast is enhanced because that berry is also reflecting UV light, but the leaves are not, which I think is really cool. Um, and this is probably one of the discoveries that I think is kind of the coolest, but also the grossest about UV light. Um, so it's kind of, it kind of enhanced our understanding about how predatory, predatory birds can find prey. So, you know, I've always wondered, like, say you see a kestrel, um, like this is a common kestrel here in this picture, um, perched on a telephone wire. Um, how can it see where its prey is and get enough to eat? Like, I know they have really good vision, but how are they able to really see that small little bull moving through like thick grass? You know, I could walk through a grassy field like 20 times and never see a mouse, more than 20 times, hundreds of times and never see a mouse. And that's because we don't see what birds see. So it turns out that one key prey for common kestrels, the metal bull behaves like a tiny dog and it used squirts of urine to mark its trails through the grass. And about 15 years ago, Finnish researchers from the University of Turku discovered that bull urine reflects UV light, <coughs> which kestrels soaring over open fields can plainly see. So once you realize raptor, raptors can follow the trail right to the animal, um, it makes a lot more sense. So basically the birds of prey, so this isn't just kestrels and bulls, are following their prey's urine to where they're located. So I think, so you just gotta follow the urine apparently, which I think is really interesting. So what does the world look like to a bird with UV vision? Um, we can't really imagine, we don't really know. Um, birds can detect more colors than humans can, seems may, may appear more varied, and colors that are already bright to our eyes may be amplified by UV reflectance, probably even brighter to birds. So we don't really know what the world really looks like from a bird's eyes, and we may never know. And that's kind of cool, I think, that that mystery kind of exists. But we can kind of detect, you know, theorize what they might be seeing. 
But one thing we do know is that their vision is different than ours and it makes them very difficult, makes it difficult for them to be able to detect windows. So, you know, um, or even know like, you know, what windows are. Here we are humans just throwing up glass everywhere that reflects these trees um, that the birds like want to fly into. Um, or, you know, they just see a three tree through um, several windows that they want to fly into. And all of a sudden we put up this glass there. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this more, um, but I really want to point out the picture here and you may not kind of hear on the lower um, left, there is something called Zen curtains on these windows. So they're kind of just tiny little cords that are spaced about four inches apart. Um, and they help break up that window shape and kind of break up that reflectance so the birds can see that the window is there. But as you can tell from this picture, it doesn't really um, take away from our view out this window. We can still see out it just fine, but it helps prevent birds from hitting those windows. Um, so that is something we'll kind of talk about at the end as well. Um, but yeah, bird vision, really awesome. And we can use this power of UV light um, to make windows that are more visible to birds that are, are like we can see through just fine. Um, so this discovery can also lead to what we call bird friendly glass, um, which is really cool. So that is the end of my presentation, my very quick presentation of anatomy and physiology. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something and I hope you're super fascinated. Um, does anybody have any questions before we move on? <laughs> All right, there's a couple hands. So adaptations and flightless birds. Did you hear that? No, I didn't hear it, but. So the, the circulatory and respiratory adaptations for birds that fly, how, how does that transition to like penguins that don't fly? So that's an awesome whatever, question. Whatever, not flightless bird. Yeah, yeah. And that was actually part of my presentation too. And then I had to cut it out because we didn't have enough time. Um, because we can also learn a lot about flight by looking at those flightless birds. Um, so their digestive systems are a little bit different. And I forget exactly how. Um, but as far as I'm aware, their circulatory systems are still, um, and their respiratory systems are very similar. Um, so they're kind of trading bird flight for being able to, if you're an ostrich or an emu, run at really high speeds. Um, and then in the term, in terms of like penguins, you know, they're swimming at really high volumes. So I'm not quite sure about how their respiratory and circulatory systems differ. But one thing that we do know is that their skeletal systems are a little bit different. So they don't have, and their musculatory systems are different. So they don't have the bone, the same bone structure and the same um, muscles as flight birds that have flight. So um, they've noticed that the keel is almost like gone in ostriches. So that bone where the flight muscles attach um, and then penguins, it's similar, it's still there, it's just kind of differently shaped because they're still using that flapping action to swim through the water. Um, so they still kind of have some of those still. Um, but yeah, as far as respiratory and circulatory system, I'm not sure that they're still that different. So, um, you know, I wonder is an ostrich ever gets like out of breath <laughs> as they're running. <laughs> I don't know if Dana and Ethan have any insight into that, but. I haven't found anything that says that they're different in terms of the respiratory and circulatory systems. And they might be, and we just don't know yet. <laughs> Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that they're, uh, you know, these flightless birds, a lot of them are the more primitive, primitive less evolved birds. I mean, I mean, they're not so uninvolved that they have jaws and teeth, but um, they still haven't quite, quite gotten there yet so um a, a lot of the you know there's been debate about birds in flight whether it's you know the feathers are there for to keep them warm or what the whole purpose was and it was flight an accident and whatever and uh so you can look at some of these uh uh, uh you can, you can think of it, there's several different things happening in their evolutionary, phys physical evolutionary processes. Uh, uh, but it's interesting that they're more, more primitive 
and uh, that's all I got. Okay, so last week, just so you know, Joe DeBold talked with us and he shared about Peregrine Falcon and you know, there's a lot of activity, nest activity close to Discovery Center. And one of the master naturalists works here at Discovery Center and has noticed that when the Peregrine Falcon are nearby, that sometimes they will kind of chase a bird and the bird will hit the window and that the Peregrine Falcon seems to pull up before hitting the window and wants to know if you all have seen that similar kind of behavior. Yeah, um, I've never seen it with Peregrine Falcons. That's really intense. I've seen it more with like Cooper's Hawks and Sharpshin Hawks, um, which oh, like- Cooper Hawk, yes. Yeah, yeah, they because they like to hang around feeders, and so um, yeah, I don't know if there must there possibly is something different with their vision that allows them to see that window, or they're kind of factoring in. But I've seen that at my own feeders. The Cooper's hawk comes in, and the poor bird hits the window, and then the Cooper's hawk gets. Um, I think it was a cardinal when I saw it. Um, but yeah, I have observed that behavior. I don't know if it's been like studied in any specific way, um, but clearly those you know, hawks and those types of birds, they definitely learn, like they learn how to hunt from their parents. So they have that like learning ability. So they do kind of have that like ability to like gain new methods, I guess. <laughs> Versus like owls who are more instinctual. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. So your last slide, Ethan, was the so seven simple actions people can take. Um, so the conservation message. <laughs> was that a? Was there a question? Yeah, we'll definitely. Oh, yeah. Cover. So if you could share those seven, right? You want to hear about the seven actions people can take. That's Wendy, awesome. can we wait for a little? <laughs> can, well, I think. You <laughs> we have one more thing to share about methodology and how people can study birds and then then that yeah it'll be about 15 minutes away that is part of their intended message so you're right on target Bridget other questions all right let's go into methodology then all right. Thank you all. Those I can tell they were very thoughtful questions. We can't hear what you're saying, but based on, you know, I can hear that you're talking. It seems very thoughtful. So we really appreciate that. That's great. All right. So is there something do you guys have another PowerPoint or. OK, perfect. Thanks. Ethan's pulling it up as we speak. Voila, ornithological uh, techniques here. And so, yeah, this is our kind of our shortest section here. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, you heard earlier about um, uh, applying a, a acoustic studies to learn about geographic variation and behavior and things. Um, and then there's um, also uh, passive acoustics and remotely sensed kind of uh, acoustic stuff. And, and it's used for studying the timing of migration, uh, occupancy of birds, and, and for other behavioral studies. Um, uh, so this picture right here is an autonomous recording unit. I've, I have a few of these um, and they can be used for, for um, they can be placed out in the field any place and you can 
um, set him on a timer. He can listen to birds or, or, or uh, amphibians or bats if you have the right microphones for that. Um, and bats are on those really high frequencies. Um, so that's a, it's been a pretty useful emerging technology that uh, people have been using quite a bit. Um, and, and so we, we just try to, and I think it's a good example of an emergency technology. Dana brought up MODIS earlier, um, an, another method of studying birds, which is an emergency technology. And, and it really gets at looking at the bird's full life cycle and where they're moving to. And, and it, we'll dive into MODIS in a little bit here. Um, but it's basically it's a radio tracking technology that's been used internationally and right here in Missouri. Um, I don't know if, if you've had Sarah Kendrick present to your group or not on this, um, but it, it, it's really uh, fits right into the, the theme of our, our, our class tonight. Um, there's, there's more labor intensive and, 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 and invasive studies that can be done like bird banding. And that's really good at getting the hard to get to data. Uh, banding has been often used to, to monitor productivity and survivorship during the breeding season. And some of those metrics can be acquired through uh, nestling survival studies too. Um, but we, we, uh, um, we at Merbo search for and, and monitor nests of grassland birds on specific study sites. And we're trying to look at things like the effects of prescribed fire and cattle grazing, otherwise known as patch burn grazing on grassland bird nesting success. So that, that has its utility. There's also a lot of different types of surveys that can be conducted. Um, those are largely done by sight and sound. You know, bird surveys can be done from discrete points called point counts. Um, they can be done like we often do with these line transects over the landscape. You can sort of see in that image there. Um, and, and there's area searches and there's survey routes. And we'll get into those in just a little bit. And uh, they're generally aimed at finding bird population densities, abundance, occupancy, that kind of thing. Um, our organization surveys focus primarily on grasslands and wetland habitats. Uh, and we use them to sort of keep an eye on the, and keep a pulse on those yearly um, uh, site level fluctuations and some state level uh, variations uh, over the years. And so we, we covered tens of thousands of acres. And so this uh, data really starts to pile up. Um, in general, there's just a lot of techniques for studying birds out there, a lot of different methodologies for analyzing data and it's constantly evolving. And uh, uh, but let's take a close, closer look at a couple of these things. So these acoustic studies, uh, which I've dabbled in, even these, there's a, on the left there, there's a, a platform that's way up in the night sky and, and you can record these, these birds as they're migrating at night. And um, when it's quiet enough in the fall, and I would suggest, I guess I was, I was looking at bird cast in a couple of days, and if it's calm enough, you can go right outside and kind of listen at night and you'll hear the migrating seeps and peeps of these birds migrating overhead. And ornithologists have used these devices to kind of track those species and the timing of their move, movements. Um, here's a really cool graphic that was created by um, uh, Evans and O'Brien, but you can find it at the, at the Colorado State University Aerial Ecology Lab. And they actually have the sounds associated with these, but basically it's a Rosetta stone for determining which species are making those little like single note calls as they're flying overhead. And um, that gets used for things like Cornell's birdcast, which is relies a lot on um, uh, radar data and citizen science data to determine um, when, when birds predict when birds are gonna move and um, sort of document when birds have been moving. So uh, birdcast.org or bird, birdcast, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, info, I think is uh, birdcast.info is where you find that. Um, and and uh, yeah, I'm trying not to dawdle on this too much, but it's absolutely a fascinating approach, large scale approach to look at when and, and how birds are moving. Then there's this one, you know, this one we mentioned earlier, bird banding, which you can see, um, like most birds observatories, we actually got our start um, uh, doing a lot of bird banding. Uh, 
this method has been used uh, throughout the life cycle of birds on their breeding grounds, on the migration, on the wintering grounds. It's very labor intensive compared to the other techniques, but it yields some important metrics. Like, uh, uh, here's an old picture of Dana and I uh, from 2010. Um, uh, Dana has an oriole there, and this is at Grand Pass Conservation Area. And we're trying to document these species that are moving through in spring migration at this time, at that particular photo. And a lot of birds just weren't observed. And you know, sometimes they're just not vocal, or, or observers aren't picking them up. But we're getting measures of them. We're determining kind of uh, different things about them that we just couldn't do in, in, in any other way. I've got to hide this thing again. Um, the So what we do here is we're, we're banning birds. And if you don't know what bird banning is, we put a band that's got a unique number associated with that individual and it's all housed in a singular database, the USGS. Uh, for banning, you can look at things like bird size, their health, their age. You couldn't otherwise get from some other type of study. Um, here we are, this, we're sticking this uh, bird down in a tube. Looks like it's, looks like a wood thrush to me and uh, measuring its tail length, um, bird being weight. So you can get a, a lot of these physical measurements that you normally just couldn't get. And so it's really important to be able to do that. Um, here's a picture of an indigo bunning. We're looking at the molt limits of its wing. So that helps you to determine its approximate age. And so uh, if people across the, the country are, are aging these birds and weighing them and measuring them, they can find out things like, how many birds return back as adults this spring versus how many you know, adults migrated last fall and how many are first year birds? And you can get a handle on um, how these birds are, are doing. Uh, there's many other questions that can be answered through this methodology, but like I said, it's very invasive and labor intensive. And we found that through our surveys, we're getting a lot more um, bird data. I, I, won't, I won't go on very long about surveys, uh, but it's important to understand that you can't assume that you've seen every bird in an area when you go out and count birds, because there's some birds that are easier to detect and some birds that are harder to detect. That's why we use varying methods to assess and consider the, the effort, um, effort meaning how much time you spend, um, how, how many points you survey, or in our case, oftentimes, how long our transects are. Here's some transects that we run through an area in the Flint Hills and looking at grassland birds. And so we, we know exactly how many meters of transect we cover and at what distances from those transects we detect those bird species. And that helps us determine you know, how detectable these birds are. And that, that all gets factored in to whatever densities the birds might be out there with a pretty high level of confidence if we detect enough of the birds. And then Given the area size and the habitat, we may go in and assume from those densities of birds what the abundances are. Um, so that's another that's another study uh, a method is, is that type of survey, uh, and and that's what we can use in. But there's also surveys that you all can take part in too, in case you might not know of them. Um, those those include ones that uh, that are right in KC, like um, Bird Safe KC project. Um, helping determine where birds are being impacted by window collisions. Um, many of you know, may know, probably know about eBird, which is a community science uh, thing to collect data. And you can see all the tools that we, resources we showed earlier that, that rely upon a lot of that data. It's, an, it's a great thing to do. Uh, uh, there's also um, Christmas bird counts that the Audubon puts on every year. So it stretches about a month around Christmas time, but there's, um, oh, there's several, uh, there's quite a few Christmas bird counts in Missouri, and they're just so much fun to go on. You can learn, learn a lot from them. And then there's also um, breeding bird survey routes. And occasionally there's vacancy on those routes. Once you get confidence with your, your bird ID, you may want to adopt a breeding bird survey route. And so these things provide a lot of different data. Um, the, the Christmas bird count each year, um, it's been going on for a hundred years. So you can imagine how that, you know, decades of data sort of stacks up over time and you can really see some long-term trends. 
And similarly, these breeding bird survey routes, they take place annually throughout Missouri in the breeding season. And they're helping us get a handle on the national and regional trends um, for a lot of our bird species. And these studies go in and they really feed in to help us determine nationally what's going on with our bird populations. So they're very useful. And like I mentioned earlier, there's always uh, a xenocanto uh, that you may wanna record birds and, and contribute to. So those are, those are some of the methodologies and some of the surveys that are out there. And I just was gonna dive into this just a real quick and, and mention this MODIS project. It's housed in Bird Studies Canada. Um, they, they've got a lot of great supporters out there that's made this a successful project, uh, including those right here in Missouri, but basically small towers that are set up that are connected to the internets. And um, whenever a critter that has this bird on the left has a black throated blue warbler has a little uh, nanotransmitter on its back with an antenna, they're, they're only a couple centimeters. Um, they can put them on bats and they put them on uh, invertebrates like dragonflies. And when they come within uh, a, a certain proximity of these towers, you can see the towers in yellow here, um, they ping off that tower. All the data goes to a central place. So, uh, our state ornithologist has been working really hard on this and uh, Sarah Kendrick. And um, so here's where we are in Missouri. Uh, 10 more stations are coming on next year to fill in the gaps too, uh, along the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. And we have sort of two transect lines going through the state. Um, NBC got a great wildlife grant uh, with five other state agencies and five NGO partners and they're placing 57 MOTA stations uh, out there and on eight Midwestern states and in three countries so we can look where our birds are wintering and track them throughout that process. Uh, special species projects are going on with kestrels, golden wing warblers and wood thrushes, uh, but there's a lot of other species at play in this. Um, just bottom line, uh, we, there's 11 detections on various, well, there's more than that recently uh, in this last migration. It's really fascinating looking at these bats. I saw a bat came in from New Jersey a couple months ago. Uh, I'm like, what are you doing, bat? That's a long way to get to, you're coming all the way to Missouri. And then, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a, we've never been able to get this information before. Um, and we can see these minuscule movements. We can see where birds are using habitat throughout their whole full life cycle like never before. And this is gonna have some great conservation implications. This is what that, that area of ornithology and science that we call applied science that we at Mirbo are all about. Um, so yeah, there's, I, I guess Dana and uh, Paige can jump back in at this point here and we can get to those much much uh waited for uh discussion about conservation and, and kind of the uh, um, uh and then we'll, we'll finish up with the seven steps yeah conservation everybody most important part <laughs> um but don't i'm gonna go through this kind of quickly um but don't take our swiftness as us not valuing how important this information is um, so first, I kind of want to start about what we're seeing in terms of bird population decline. So um, there was a journal, uh, an article or a paper published recently, somewhat recently, um, in the journal Science in September of 2019. Um, and what this uh, paper showed us was that uh, wild bird populations in the continental, continental U.S. and Canada have declined by almost 30% since 1970. So what this means is a loss of, of 2.9 billion breeding adult birds um, uh, in gone in 50 years, like this uh, graphic suggests. If you want to go to the next slide, Ethan. Mm, already there. <laughs> um, and what they also saw, what that was pretty significant, is they saw these declines in almost every bird guild. Um, and I really want to draw your attention to that one farthest to the right, grassland birds. So this is. Um, very essential um, for birds here in Missouri um, and what MRBO works, that's a guild that our MRBO works to conserve um, very much so um, are those grassland birds. They also found that even some of the birds that we think of is common or common, our, lose, uh, our populations are declining at somewhat alarming rates. So blue jays, one in four loss, Baltimore Orioles, we love Baltimore Orioles, um, one in three lost, white-throated sparrows, 
um, which are beautiful songsters, um, Dark Eyed Juncos, one and three, Rose Breasted Grosbeaks, a favorite migrant of ours, um, one and four lost. So it's not just birds that we think of as more specialized or more rare, it's also these common species. But there is good news, and that is that conservation works. Um, so they saw increases in some of these specific species. So waterfowl or ducks, um, raptors saw an increase, turkey saw an increase. And a common thread that you might notice between these species is that when we invest in the conservation of them, it works and that we can see these population increase or we pass um, legislation that can help protect those birds. In the case of raptors, um, we can see their populations increase. Yeah, a case of raptors and in the case of waterfowl, things like the North American Wetlands Act, which helped us put a lot of conservation on the ground. Um, and, and then the, the, the consumptive users, the hunting and fishing community has put an immense amount of resources into driving that success. And so if we can do the same for a lot of these other groups, these, these are the perfect model. Exactly, good point. And then next slide. Um, so some of the different reasons that we're seeing these birds decline, um, there are a lot of a variety of reasons. Um, the most, the one that we most suspect being habitat loss or habitat degradation. Um, but some of the driver, the graph that you're seeing there, the drivers of bird declines, the, these are like direct mortality um, that are human caused, meaning like um, they're not, you know, predation or anything like that. So you can see cats are a huge problem. 2.4 billion birds in the US alone every single year um, with window collisions being next at a still at a very alarming rate um, into the millions. Um, and, and then some of those other collisions and different things as well. And there still is insufficient data. We don't really know the effect of pesticides for an instance on like a widespread um, population decline. Um, so these are some of the different drivers of those bird declines, excluding habitat loss, which is yeah, those, harder to estimate. Those are direct drivers. So I guess in some, we've got all these great methodologies out there that we're still using to, to use as tools to get a fine, good handle on what's driving these things. And we've come a long way with understanding what's leading to our bird declines. And so uh, with, with partners, uh, the North American Bird Conservation Initiative, with Audubon Societies and others, we've come up with uh, several, seven simple actions that you can do. Um, and, and what, instead of just sitting at home and being like, woe is me, there's all these things happening and they're way bigger than me and way beyond me, there are some things that really do make an impact out there. Um, so there's, there's uh, I, I don't know if we never decided who would talk about which thing real quickly, but- um, got it though, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so- um, No, I don't think that we have time actually to talk about every nope. one of these things. As long as folks really look at these and consider all of them, um, a lot of ornithologists, a lot of conservation biologists with a ton of I mean, just like literally like centuries of collective experience, looked at all of these things and thought, what, what are the things that the, you know, average person can do in their daily lives that can really help birds? So collectively speaking, if we all did these things, there would be literally hundreds and hundreds of millions more birds than there are right now. So I want to tell you folks that, you know, the Master Naturalist program is incredibly important. Like you all contribute so much on the ground to education and to um, things like habitat restoration and community science. And now that you are about to be Master Naturalist, please, please help us save birds and help us save other wildlife because it's, it's really not going well. Um, as you could see from some of the things that Paige and Ethan just shared and, and we all need to do our part and these things are, you know, they take varying amounts of time like it's super easy to buy and drink shade grown coffee and tasty. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit more involved to think about all of the various ways that pesticides enter your life, um, both directly that you might use and stop using or as far as your food is concerned. But we definitely encourage everyone to do whatever they can because we're at a point where birds really, really need our help. 
So we have if a couple questions. To... Okay, so yeah, it's small on our screen. So if you'll just list the seven items. Oh, I'm sorry for sure. I thought I've been afraid the whole time that we're like these huge things and everything is huge for y'all. Um, make windows safer, as Paige discussed earlier. Keep cats indoors, which is also better for the life expectancy of your cat. Use native plants, which support native insects, which are food for our native birds. Avoid pesticides. Drink shade grown coffee because the forests that are tropical birds and the birds that you know, live here in Missouri, but migrate down to the tropics, use all these different layers of habitat that are above um, coffee plants. And so that's a, that's a really big one of how you can help migratory birds. Use less plastic. I'm not even gonna get started because I will go on for a really long time, but plastic throughout its entire life cycle is really, really damaging to our environment. I definitely encourage you to look into that um, and do community science. So many of the things that Ethan talked about with especially with eBird and the Breeding Bird Survey and Elizabeth Stokes who started this, this session by talking about the things that you can do there in the KC area. So yeah, I would look for, I would just clarify that one thing, um, shade grown coffee, not all shade grown coffee is bird friendly. So make sure you look for a bird friendly certified coffee. I think um, the Smithsonian has some available it, they'll, they'll list the ones that they certify. Uh, National Audubon now has some uh, bird-friendly coffee. So make sure you, you really find that it's bird-friendly, not just shade grown. <clears throat> Thank you. Questions? Yeah. All right, so the question is when uh, you have a neighbor or friend who has an outdoor cat. How do you address that? Yeah, fight them. <laughs> <laughs> nah, there's a, a great question. It, 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 it can be really, it's a very interesting and, and it can be a, one of the most contentious issues that we ever talk about. And it's really funny because you have cat lovers on both sides of this debate. Um, and 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 it's, you know, the point Dana brought up earlier about it's extending the life expectancy of the cat as well uh, by keeping them indoors is one thing. Um, but sometimes you can just, art, you know, present all the evidence and, and uh, make all the points about them not being a native predator and all the data about the damage they do. And sometimes people just they just will not be convinced that it's the best thing to keep their cat indoors. Yep, go ahead, Paige. My, my advice, and obviously we don't know the answers because people are complicated. You know, this, that's like a people issue. Um, and we all have toughs with our neighbors, but my approach would be like Ethan saying to have conversations with them and to kind of approach it in this, hey, it's better for your cat to leave it inside. Cause I think that is a misconception people have. So if you talk to a veterinarian, um, there's a lot of diseases out there that cats can catch and some of them they can pass to you. Um, and so it's healthier for your cat. Um, and, you know, and there's different things you can do to still kind of let them have like outdoor time. Like there are cat leashes now, there's something called cat patios, which you have to be kind of careful about how you're going about that too. Um, so that would be my like approach to like having that conversation with your neighbor is kind of like, hey, like I really love birds too. And, but also like, hey, this might actually be better for your cat. <laughs> And there, I have a pamphlet that I could get you. <laughs> that you could get them if you want. I, th I think the Burroughs Audubon Library has some literature as well. Oh, I think they do. I think they yeah. do. Yeah. Okay, good. Maria. So someone shared that they had this situation in their neighborhood and they had their neighbor put a bell on their cat so that it would not eat all the birds, the, yeah, the birds at their feet are. That is quite helpful. Um, a situation in which that doesn't completely do the job is um, with a lot of fledglings who really aren't flighted yet or they're you know very clumsy flyers that can't get off the ground. Cats can still get them. Um, but 
a bell, scaring off birds is definitely better than nothing. <laughs> yeah, just make sure it's like a cowbell. <laughs> oh, wait, this reminds me. I so this is kind of a similar solution um, where it doesn't really apply to fledgling birds, but you know how we talked about birds can see in UV light. So I think they make these collars now that kind of reflect UV light and may help make the cats like stand out more to the birds. Um, but again, like Dana said, like they're not super effective. They're not the end all be all solution, um, but better than nothing if you can't convince your neighbor of anything else. <laughs> so. Gift them a collar. So someone's showing that there's a study with cat predation information and to look into that as well. Any? Yeah, so, absolutely. That Peter, Peter Mara's lab uh, had a very comprehensive study on, on the, the metrics of cat predation. And keep in mind, it's not just um, birds, it's also bats, um, frogs, uh, a lot of our, our uh, rodents and, and things that we, we actually do care about as well. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been really great. We appreciate you all spending your evening with us. Wendy, thanks so much for setting this up. And thanks everyone for sticking with us and being in the great, big theater. A great chapter, a great group of people. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future. Yeah, thanks for letting us nerd out with you about birds. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And uh, we'll say good night. Sounds great. Wendy, please feel free to give our emails to anyone that is, you know, wants more info or is interested in working on, you know, some of our existing projects. And we'll see y'all in the KC area. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>